Hello everyone and welcome to our new ETX webinar series, which we will continue today with the webinar on how to build a resilient engineering IT infrastructure in the cloud, a topic becoming even more important in today's world. My name is Ines Pich and I'm hosting the webinar today. Each day, organizations are moving their applications to a private or public cloud for a variety of reasons, such as faster innovation, addressing urgent capacity needs, or refreshing their IT infrastructure. Before we start the webinar, a few housekeeping items for you. A recording of this webinar will be available shortly. Throughout the webinar, we will be compiling questions, you might have. Please feel free to post them into the ask a question box on the right side of your screen. We will get to them at the end of the presentation. Also check out our product pages and opendex.com for more information. With this, I would like to introduce you today to today's presenters. Welcome Martin Tietz, Product Marketing Manager and Markus Kauli, Solution Consultant. So let's get started. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Ines. And I'd like to start with um, describing the scenario that we will be going through today. So basically, we will start from scratch. We will have a number of items that we need to bring into order, like um, application servers running on Linux, running on uh, Windows. We have uh, engineering software that we like to uh, deploy to the cloud then. We have cloud infrastructure and we have on the left side, we have um, end users that use uh, devices like uh, laptops, Macs or iPads that want to access the engineering software. And at the end of today's webinar, we will create this um, setup here. We will have created this setup with um, <clears throat> um, application servers running in the Azure cloud with application software running in the Azure cloud. We will have a high availability Exceed Turbo X server cluster that will serve the end users on the left side that can use then um, Windows, Mac, iPad or Linux workstations to remotely access their 3D engineering software like ANSYS, um, CATIA or other software that is being used um, that has strong graphical um, requirements. So this is what you will see at the end. And with that, I'd hand over for the first time to Marcus for the first part of the demonstration. Thanks, Martin. OK, so um, we, as Martin said, we're going to be provisioning some service for you this morning. We're going to be provisioning uh, two brand new virtual machines running Linux. Um, we're going to start with provisioning uh, Linux server, which will be our Exceed Turbo X server. We're actually going to build a cluster of ETX servers today, so that will be our first click cluster member. We're going to um, add a connection node to that same Linux machine so we can run some applications. We've also got an existing Windows 10 virtual machine, which we're going to connect in to demonstrate uh, Windows connectivity uh, with ANSYS. So before we go back to Martin, I just want to show you uh, some of the basic stuff we're going to be going through today. You should be able to see my desktop. Uh, my name is Marcus Cowley. I'm our principal solution consultant at OpenText, and I work with our salespeople and our customers to uh, install and evaluate and test uh, Exceed Turbo X. So this morning I'm going to be taking you through the more technical sides of this demonstration. Um, so to start with, we're going to be using uh, Microsoft Azure, as Martin has said, and we're going to be working inside this resource group here. This resource group is a shared resource group for the pre-sales pre uh, guys in Europe. Um, and as you can see, we have a couple of machines. Uh, this one we can ignore. This is a, another customer testing machine, uh, but this is our Windows server, and it's going to be uh, joined into our ETX cluster, and we're going to use that for sharing some applications. Today we're going to be using the Azure Cloud Shell to issue some commands to Azure to build these machines. Um, and the first command we're going to run is going to start the deployment of our first server. So let's just um, pop this command in here. 
Um, so we're going to use the AZ, uh, AZ deployment um, command and we're passing in some parameters, um, including the name of the, um, the template that we're going to use uh, for the install. We're going to pass in a parameters file as well. And we're also going to override some of those parameters by specifying a, a name for the server. In this case, it would be GPUW server one. And we're also specifying my email as the contact person. And we're also going to create a cluster. So if we kick that off, we should be able to go back to Martin and come back in a few minutes time um, and have that first server deployed and we will carry on from there. Thanks, Martin. OK. So. While these servers are being um, <clears throat> deployed now, let me explain a few things that we're doing here. So remote cloud or cloud access for graphically demanding software. That's what we are talking about today. The scenario that we are implementing today can be uh, any of these, the following ones. On-premise, so your remote access for software hosted in your own office or data centers. So on-premise at your own places or at multiple of your own locations. You can have multiple data centers, of course. It can be in a private cloud. so. You have uh, private machines in a cloud service by any of the cloud providers, really. So it works with AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, but any cloud provider really can do that. You can have a public cloud for remote access <clears throat> that is hosted in a public cloud. So public cloud means that the machines are shared um, with others. So there might be some security things um, that you might want to think about private cloud, but whatever cloud you use, um, it, all the, the scenarios, we, the, all the installations we show you today will work. And I think the most important one is the bottom one, which is hybrid, a mix of all the above. When you are starting to think about moving your uh, complex engineering software to the cloud, then you probably will go in um, multiple steps. And the hybrid approach will allow, allow you to do that. And you will see <clears throat> you know, the things that Marcus has just started by uh, provisioning the, some servers. This is like one of the steps that you can take <clears throat> to bring your engineering software to the cloud. And you might uh, start with maybe a certain applications or you might start with certain locations, moving people from certain locations to the cloud or whatever. So hybrid, I think, is the most important part because that allows you to um, <clears throat> go to the cloud at your own pace. So here are a few more things about the environment that we are creating today. At the end, you will be seeing on the left side, you see the screenshots of the software. Ansys Mechanical, and um, that is running on Windows. So we will have a Windows application server installed. We will <clears throat> have FreeCAD 3D for a Linux um, 3D product design here with that engine head that you see on the, on the lower part. You see what kind of uh, machine we are using here in the uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud. It is an NV6 standard machine that has six CPU cores, um, 56 gigabytes of memory, <clears throat> lots of disk space as SSD drives. And at the bottom you see a, this one M60, which is an NVIDIA Tesla virtualized graphics card that can be shared between um, multiple uh, cloud users basically. And we will have three virtual machines running at the end. One Linux virtual machine hosting the uh, FreeCAD and ETX server. One Linux machine running other Linux applications. And we will have a virtual machine hosting Ansys Mechanical. So <clears throat> we just needed to start the um, provisioning process in Asia because that takes several um, minutes. And um, here's the agenda of what we are going uh, through today. So the first two things, overview of the Azure use case and provisioning the servers have already been done. We are, I'm going to talk about remote access is here to stay. We're going to talk about the automated installation and configuration of ETX, about authentication and security. You will have plenty of time to see user demonstrations of you know, how the software looks like that uh, we have be, that we are deploying in the cloud now. And we will build an Exceed Turbo X server cluster, which is the high availability, high availability solution for um, Exceed Turbo X. And we will use um, Windows and Linux engineering applications. Uh, summary and question answers at the end then. 
The pandemic has actually forced companies to find new ways to work. McKinsey and co believe that the experiences of COVID-19 have accelerated digital transformation adoption strategies. The crisis is leading many CIOs to rethink IT investment strategies. Business and employees are adapting to working remotely to help reduce the virus from spreading and causing expensive plant shutdowns and more supply chain disruption. Cloud-based information management platforms can provide the flexibility and scalability that companies need, especially during a period of business disruption. Best-in-class cloud-based solutions allow employees to work more collab collaboratively than ever. Employee productivity can be maintained and in some cases increased in times of crisis and business disruption can be minimized. So this is the situation. And here is how one of the uh, OpenText XC Turbo X customers uh, could handle the uh, um, COVID situation earlier in um, March this year. This large European semiconductor company could move 300 engineers to the home office from one day to another, which is pretty amazing. Due to, due to the fact that our company standard for application access is ETX, this could be done without any disruption of the business. Performance is as if working in the office and security standards are fulfilled. So performance, security, very important things that we are going to talk about as well. I'm pretty sure that this would not have been possible with any other product. So that's what a customer is saying about the <coughs> ETX um, solution that we are um, implementing in the cloud today. Cloud-based remote working is a great foundation for the new normal. So going beyond the pandemic, uh, work from anywhere in the pandemic, but of course, um, the life we have and the work style we have means lots of business travel outside the pandemic, visiting customer sites, visiting construction sites, visiting, visiting production sites, visiting other offices of an organization, and you need remote access. Remote access for the cloud allows you to create flexible global teams. You can add users anywhere. You can hire talent where it is available regardless of what country, what continent it is on. You can quickly give um, access to resources um, in a cloud environment. You can support temporary resources. You can support access to customers to your solutions. You have fast and easy access, powerful collaboration. And one thing that's really important with cloud is that you have very predictable cost. The cost of all components of the cloud infrastructure is precisely predictable, so you know every month what the bill will be. And there are no big surprises in the cost for um, IT infrastructure, IT support, and all these things. And one very important thing for cloud as well is the easy breathing, as I would call it. Um, companies like OpenText, for example, acquire other companies, and you want to get these employees going quickly and deploying new desktops or new applications to the new employees quickly. <clears throat> and if you're an engineering com uh, organization and you buy another engineering organization, you want to quickly deploy your tool set of um, 3D applications or engineering applications to the new users and having a cloud environment, that is really easy to do because you can quickly <clears throat> um, add new application servers um, as needed. And of course, the other way works as well. You can easily scale down resources if that should be required. ETX provides high availability. Um, Marcus has mentioned that, that the first part of the server cluster is being uh, deployed right now as I speak. And in, with the high availability, that basically means you have multiple ETX servers in that server cluster here in the middle. Um, and should one of the servers fail, then the other servers will take over. So eliminating, eliminating single points of failure to make your remote access infrastructure very fail safe. And you basically have end users that go through an HTTPS load balancer through the ETX server cluster to one of the servers in the server cluster. And that would be this standard way. And in the case of a failure, the load balancer would then direct the users to the remaining available servers. And you will see that as well when um, all the things have been installed when Marcus demos the administration interface. We will be configuring application servers. We will, <clears throat> um, the application servers are called nodes here, and we will create node groups from several application servers. 
The node groups are then the basis for load balancing. So <clears throat> the users will be load balanced across the nodes of a node group automatically via the ETX solution. Authentication and security is very important. You can import users and groups from all major authentication systems. So <clears throat> OpenText XC Turbo X can import 40 plus um, uh, <clears throat> data from um, authentication systems from 40 plus different um, authentication systems. And that means that you can get very quickly going in deploying your users and giving them access to applications. For example, if you have a group of engineers that you need ANSYS, then you just assign ANSYS to the group of engineers and they, the engineers will have access to ANSYS and will have an icon on their dashboard where they can start ANSYS uh, mechanical. Same thing, as I mentioned, when you acquire new companies, you import the users into ETX and assign them immediately via user groups. You, you assign them um, to the applications they should be able to use. And I think with that, we, I hope the deployment process is the first step is through. Marcus? Yep, back it to is you. indeed. So let me go back to my, my screen. OK, thanks for that, Martin. Um, so here we are back in Azure, and as you can see from the uh, Azure uh, Cloud Shell, my deployment has just completed, and it provides me some feedback in the form of a JSON or XML file uh, showing me uh, all the settings that were uh, taken in during the during the install. OK, so if I refresh my view here, we should now see I have a new server here, which is ET, MC ETX 12 GPU W Server 1. That's going to be the, 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 the first server in our cluster. Um, so before we're going to go to that first server, I'm actually going to kick off the second server install, and we're going to come back to him a little bit later. So let's just post in the next command here. So I'm using the same template, um, and all the same settings, apart from the fact I'm telling it to join a cluster, and I'm passing it the address of the server that's uh, currently in the cluster. This will be the new server name, W Server 2, and we'll kick that off and get into a demonstration. Okay, so here's my login for the first server. You can see it's W Server 1, so it's the same server as we just built. And I'm going to sign in. And first of all, we'll go to the, the dashboard. Okay, so ETX, as we call it, is designed to provide high speed, high quality access to graphically demanding applications. It provides users with a local application experience, even when accessing remotely over long distances. ETX can be hosted on-prem in your data centers, in the cloud, or in hybrid configurations to provide your key users and design engineers uh, high quality access to the applications they use every day, regardless of their physical location and from a large variety of devices. As more companies seek ways to maintain and boost productivity during challenging times, secure and fast access to key applications has never been more important. And we're finding that more and more over the last six months, customers have come to us who have had ETX in the past for dedicated teams, and suddenly they need to, to roll that out to, to a lot more users. So here is the dashboard for ETX. I've just logged in. Um, this dashboard is dynamic, so if I run an application, uh, the dashboard changes to reflect that I've got an active application. In this case, I've just run uh, a simple extern application. But this also changes to show shared sessions. So a user might be sharing a session with me. Users can share sessions so they can work on the same project, discuss the same thing. And so this dashboard is the way the users can go between applications. They can start different applications. It has some messaging integrated to them for them as well. Um, and it allows them to interact with, with ETX. The servers today we're using are NV6 machines, as Martin said, and uh, they use the NVIDIA cards to provide server-side rendering. So server-side rendering means we're using the hardware in the server to, to provide the rendering and H.264 compression and other functionality before we're sending that information to the client displays. 
So it's quite easy to talk about server-side rendering, but what I thought I'd do is show you server-side rendering so we can appreciate what it means. So first of all, I'm going to start um, uh, OpenGL test application called GLX Spheres. Um, I'm forcing this uh, application to display uh, 1 million polygons uh, and I'm forcing it to 800 by 800 screen size. Now this is using client-side rendering. And this is traditional rendering, what you'd get if you were connecting remotely, just using standard remote connection tools. As you can see, it's a very unimpressive 3.7 frames per second uh, with a very low number of pixels being actually drawn. In this other window here, I'm going to launch the same application with the same settings, uh, but I'm going to um, use server side rendering. Demonstrate the difference here. OK, so server side rendering, I'm actually passing it into our server side renderer and I'm passing in the command, the same million polygons and same screen size. As you can see, it's detected the Tesla M60 and that's the sort of difference in performance. So server side rendering doesn't just help a little bit. OK, server side rendering makes a massive improvement in how these applications can be displayed remotely and how users can interact with them. Now, most users aren't interacting with an application that's doing a million polygons a second, but this really does start to illustrate how important it is to, to, to share the hardware on the servers. If you've got hardware sitting in laptops and local PCs, they're being used by a single person. If you put them into the cloud and you use a shared hardware, you get a much bigger bang for your buck and more users can enjoy this sort of performance. OK, so let's close those two down. That's a quick um, a quick uh, user demonstration. We're going to come back to that uh, a little bit later on. But in a way, uh, you know, giving users access to stuff in ETX is very, very straightforward. Um, what's more important, though, I think, is how that is being managed in the background. Um, and this is where ETX stands head and shoulders above other products in this area. We really focus on how you're going to manage those users, how you can manage the application servers, and how you're going to control access to those servers. So, for instance, here we have our nodes that Martin described as um, our application servers. We have one Windows node at the moment, we have one Linux node, and we have another one, which uh, I very much hope is still deploying here. Here it is. Uh, users and profiles. So we have users and we have user groups. As Martin said, these users can be imported from a variety of different systems, or you could import groups directly from your LDAP or Active Directory. So if you add a user to Active Directory into the engineers group, if that group's imported in ETX, the engineer is automatically able to log into ETX into the engineers group. So we can assign users also to groups, and then we can then assign profiles and applications to those specific user groups. If we look at a user group here for engineers, we can see that Andreas, myself, and, and Matthias, uh, Martin, rather, are in this, um, this, uh, this group. Matthias isn't, I can add him in there, and he will now have access to the profiles that I publish to those groups. So profiles are the things that users use to actually start applications. Um, and you can have users create their own, of course, or you can create them for them, and you can then publish and distribute those out to your users. So I can press the distribute button, and I can distribute those out to, to users. So all the people in the designers group will now have access to the FreeCAD application. Okay. So we can also create no groups, like I said. So I'm going to create a no group for engineering here. And I'm going to add in our first Linux server. And we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll add we'll add um, the new Linux server as well when it's when it connects in, which shouldn't be too long. So we had a Windows server, if you remember, uh, installed. So let's um let's close my session for now. You can have multiple sessions, of course. I'm just going to keep it simple and we'll open my Windows desktop session. 
so with the connections and the users and the nodes, you can you know you can you can map nodes into node groups and have people load balanced. You can also direct users to specific nodes, um, and you've also got a whole set of uh, load balancing criteria you can use. So you can direct based on CPU usage, memory usage, number of users, and various other things. So I'm going to open Hansys Mechanical here. Um, it does take a few seconds to load, so let's. Um, Let's let that load up. OK, so as you can see, my Windows 10 desktop is here and it's loading up. And uh, these are my profiles that I've got uh, published to me. As, the, as a user, I can also add my own profiles if I want to create my own connections, or I could choose published applications. And published applications are applications that the administrator has published to me and I can then create them as I need. And there I have my published application for K layout. So let's go back and see if ANSYS is loaded. It has, so let's load up our model. And this um, model was provided to us um, by one of our customers. Here it comes. OK. So some of the uh, keener eyed viewers might well um, recognize this as a, um, a transmission, probably a truck transmission. A European truck or an American car. I'm not sure which it is, um, but let's see. And we can pop and we can explode this quite nicely. The response is very, very nice indeed. And I can also zoom in here. Zoom out. And it's very, very usable. Bear in mind, this is coming from West Europe and the West Europe uh, Data Center, and I'm based in the south of England. That's a fair, it's a fair distance for this data to have traveled. As you can see, it's very responsive and works very well. I think that's a key thing. If you deliver an application to your to your design engineers and it's not responsive, or it doesn't work fast enough, they're going to find it extremely frustrating when they're working on quite a creative task and the software isn't keeping up with them. So it's very, very important that the software actually works so they can be productive. Otherwise, everything they do costs your company twice as much money because it takes twice as much time to do. So there is ANSYS running very nicely through ETX. So let's close this. I can suspend the session and it goes to a suspended state and I can come back at a later stage and resume that session. Well, that session suspended, I can close my machine. I can go to another machine and log in again and resume it for a different location. But that session is still running. So I'm running some rendering or some processing or calculations um, or sort of test suite. I can leave that running in a suspended session and come back to it the following day, the following week, the following month, whatever it turns out to be and suspended sessions don't use a license. So a user can have multiple sessions, they can suspend them, they can resume them, and they're only going to use a license when they resume those sessions, when they're actually running a session. OK, let's go have a peep in here and see what's happened on our nodes. And it looks like it still hasn't finished deploying. That's a little bit annoying, but we'll give it some more time. <laughs> OK, so um, there's lots of other things inside Server Manager, of course, for, for you know, we can go and look at a cluster. We've created a cluster. Um, when you have ETX servers in a cluster, they share all the data, they share the session information, and you can load balance users onto the, the web servers, and it provides for resilience. Um, hopefully, our second cluster machine is going to start up here and uh, join this cluster pretty soon. But in the meantime, Let's have a look at our users. We've got Martin set up. He's in the engineering group. Um, and uh, Martin, you should be able to log in now okay. to the W server. Um, 
and uh, show us uh, you launching an application and I'll come back here to finish off the, the clustering stuff. Thank you, Marcus. Let me go to my browser window. So here's the link to the Asia installation here. So I'm using the same URL that Marcus was using. And I'm now signing into the ETX server that got deployed in the first place when we started this webinar. And you can see these are the applications that have been automatically assigned to me. Um, I can start that Windows 10 desktop if I want to. I'm going to start the FreeCAD now. FreeCAD is a Linux 3D open source um, design software that we use for demonstration purposes just to see how the performance is. And um, it takes a while to, for this to launch, um, as you have seen with um, ANSYS, but that's not really showing the performance of the XC Turbo X. That's just the time the application needs to load because these are really massive graphical applications. And once they are loaded, then you can load a, um, a data model here. Let me load that uh, robot here. And um, now you can really measure the performance here. You can I can uh, navigate in that. I don't if I hit the right button. I can quickly navigate. I can use control plus to zoom in and you see that is really fast. Control minus to zoom out. And um, then FreeCut has that turntable feature where you can let this thing rotate quickly. And you see that is the now the power of the NVIDIA Tesla graphics card running, you know, providing server side rendering here. And um, with that, I think I hand over back to Marcus and we'll see if the server deployment has finalized now. In fact, um, the second server has now come up. Um, we were just being impatient. Um, so the second server has joined the cluster. Um, and behind ETX, the reason for sharing my screen again, is that we have a full set of APIs. So you can use these APIs to deeply integrate ETX into your current workflow, um, uh, work pro job processing systems and the like. You can add users, you can add nodes dynamically, you can create profiles, you can launch sessions, you can do all kinds of server management stuff also through the API. And so some of our customers have used this API to, to, to integrate ET, uh, ETX with their VDI deployment systems. They might use VMware um, and VMware spits out the, 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 the Linux virtual machines or the Windows virtual machines. And then through using the API, those machines then register themselves into the ETX cluster. They can be issued to users and you can limit the number of users per node as well. So you can say if you create a lot of Windows nodes, you can go in here and you can say, limit total sessions to one. So that is a one to one connection then between the user and the application node. So yes, you can provide VDI style, solu VDI style solutions, but it's more beneficial when you try to do something a bit more complicated than just issue Windows desktops with, with Outlook and Word and PowerPoint. This is really for the, the heavy, heavy lifting applications. So Martin, if you don't mind, I'm going to just actually um, finish off my demonstration here. Yes, please right. go ahead. I'm That's add, really interesting. I'm going to add the second server into our node group now. Um, so we now have the W server one and W server two have come through. They're in the node group. And I was saying about directing sessions to specific node groups. If I take a copy of my X term here and make it, uh, I'm going to call it LB for load balancing, and um, I go into this group, I can actually say, you know, when I start my session, I can target nodes. And in this case, I'm targeting any node, but I can also go down and choose node group. So you can specify profiles that target a node group. And then that session will be load balanced into that node group. And so let's just do a simple test. I should be able to start this session here. Simple X term. Um, and that should go to uh, one of the servers in the cluster. And that's gone to W server one. 
Okay, I'm going to go back and run the same the same icon. And it now, in theory, should be load balanced to the second server in the cluster. And there we have W server one and W server two. And so users coming in, you know, if they start with an X term and then they load their modules and they do lots of different commands here and then they launch the application, that would all work through the same mechanism and it's been load balanced into the connection nodes. So we have this idea of load balancing at the ETX server level, which is provided in the web dashboard. And then we also have the load balancing at the node level as well. OK, so Martin, thanks for that. I'm glad he came up. I wanted to finish my demo. Um, I will I will hand back to you um, now. Thank you, Marcus. So <clears throat> yeah, that was very interesting to see though. <clears throat> At the end, it all uh, worked. There was a little hiccup that uh, was unexpected for us because the timing was a bit different to our previous tests, but um, I'm really glad this worked all out. And just again to mention that we started really from scratch. We had nothing in the cloud. Um, just this one um, Ansys Windows virtual machine and we got everything working now with um, a full ETX cluster with high availability. And um, I think it's a good example of how quickly you can start a cloud um, environment open text XC Turbo X. And as I mentioned also in the presentation, it's, <clears throat> you know, you likely start with a hybrid environment. You slowly start deploying your applications to the cloud, but the benefits are massive. We kind of wrap things up now. So with Exceed Turbo X, you get everything under control for the users. You have easy one-click application start. You have seen the dashboards of, that I and Marcus have. You have this nice suspend and resume features that allows you to, for example, to start long-running simulations. And then, you know, in the evening at home, suspend the sessions session and resume the session next day to see the results of that um, computation. So that's very handy. You can invite collaborators into sessions, so you can do session share, screen sharing. You can get IT help via, via session mirroring, not only for, uh, for ETX, of course, but also for the um, products and software you are using for your work. And users have Windows, Mac, iPad OS, and Linux clients to access their <clears throat> remote cloud-based um, engineering applications. Also, IT is quite happy in using um, uh, Exceed Turbo X. They have easy one-click administration of application servers, applications, users and groups, the security behind it, and their entire remote access infrastructure. So they see the status of everything at a click of a mouse, and they have that high availability architecture that <clears throat> enables you to you know, build a highly fail-safe um, remote access infrastructure for thousands of users, if you like. Also, organizations have everything under control using um, Exceed Turbo X. They have a very contained, contained predictable cost if they use that in, in, the co in the cloud. They have a basis for a resilient organization that can quickly react to problem problematic situations, being it pandemics, or social situations, or whatever is happening on the world. You can implement or you can <clears throat> receive large monetary savings via data center consolidation. If you, for example, have multiple data centers on multiple <coughs> continents, um, you can basically uh, consolidate those into one cloud data center and save massive money. That can be millions of dollars a year or millions of euros in uh, Europe, of course. You have higher user productivity because of um, easy access to your solutions and high performance of the solutions. And for organizations, very important as well is the secured intellectual property. Saving your intellectual pro property or securing your intellectual property in a data center is much easier than having IP floating around on user workstations anywhere in the world that have different operating systems, systems versions different software versions installed. So cloud makes everything easier for the user, for IT, and for the entire organization. And with that, we are pretty much done with the webinar. I just want to remember you that this is a webinar series that is that will be continued. The next one will be sec about security, <clears throat> best, practice, best practices with ETX. The third one will be scaling your 
access infrastructure, and then we will have one um, for the user, how to get how users can get the most about ETX. So <clears throat> watch out for our webinar invites in the coming weeks and months. And with that, I think I'll hand back over to the entire team for answering the questions that came in during the webinar. OK, thanks, Martin. So we have a couple of questions that came in. I guess they are all for Marcus. So the first one is any suge suggestions how to measure ETX bandwidth requirements for one user session on Linux in Asia? OK, I think so that's a big question, Rafael. I think um, you need to um, I think measuring performance, manage, measuring bandwidth is always something that's quite tricky to do. With ETX, you can limit the user bandwidth, um, but I would build some structured tests where you have a user doing certain things and then you look at the bandwidth that's being used through one of your network devices and then scale it from there. Um, I think it's the same with trying to measure performance. You need to try to, try to create some, some baseline that you can measure against. Um, so, or you can use the restrict bandwidth option inside ETX to force the session to use a restricted bandwidth. Okay. Uh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to go through the questions. Yeah, should I go through yeah. the rest? Yeah. Um, is uh, set up as your application gateway being used? What is the main reason to not a regular load balancer? No, I would just use a regular load balancer. It, it doesn't particularly matter. It just has to direct to to either of the ETX web servers. Uh, could we provide some more information on how to integrate login process to the Azure AD? Would it be possible to see the demo of the integration? Uh, we can certainly get some information uh, for you, Rafael. If you um, drop us an email or we'll come back to you. We've got your email anyway. We'll come back to you after the call to try to um, uh, help you with that. Uh, we don't have any readily available documentation, but it's certainly something we're working on at the moment as we're working on these scripts for Azure deployments. Any others there? Um, there are three more, Marcus. Um, can I install the ETX trial version in the AWS cloud? Yes, you can. So we provide um, uh, evaluation software, which will allow 100 users to test the software for 30 or 60 days, whatever it is that, 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 that you require. And that's uh, full software, full product. So you can deploy that um, in Azure. You could deploy it on-prem, you can deploy it any way you like, and we provide an evaluation license key with that, which would allow you to use it for a certain amount of time. But definitely, and this is a very good point, um, all our customers do in-depth evaluations of our product uh, because it needs to be tested in your environment. You've got your own sort of users, your own applications, your own workflows, and so we very much encourage customers to try the software um, intensely um, and test it properly. Um, before going ahead. So yeah, you can install it wherever you like. OK, thank you. And the next one is, does an ETX user license count per application being in use or per connected user? OK, so it's, um, it's a concurrent um, user license, so it's per connected user. Um, a single user connecting to the same ETX server from multiple devices would use a single user license, okay? So it's really is concurrent. So if you have a 20 user license, any 20 users can have live sessions at the same time. Suspended sessions don't use licenses, so they don't they don't come into the calculations. 